From historic downtown Waco, deep in the heart of Texas, this is First Sunday Morning, a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Waco. A part of our community, celebrating fellowship together and sharing ministry with others through the timeless good news of the gospel story of new life in Christ Jesus. Welcome to First Baptist Waco. I am Doris Hambrick. Pat Hambrick and I moved to Waco January of 1981 and immediately joined this church. For much of that time, I've spent Sunday mornings sitting back here on the platform with the sanctuary choir and enjoying looking out on the faces of friends and family. If you've ever thought about joining the sanctuary choir, now would be a good time to do it. And if you're worried about the tryout, the only thing you have to try on is the choir robe to see if it's the right length. Talk to us if, you, if you'd like to think about that. Uh, the choir, as you have already figured out, is not on the platform this morning, and that is because we are graced with the presence of Mr. Michael T. Smith. Michael is, yes. Michael is retired after a career of music ministry in various churches. He, he says he's retired, but he also is listed as the president of Cross Keys uh, Corporation, Corporation? Company, Company which, uh, which arranges tours for churches and um, musical groups. Uh, he is no stranger to Waco, though he lives in Dallas. He is a graduate of the Baylor uh, School of Music and um, so welcome back. Thank you. Speaking of strangers, I have here a bulletin from First Baptist Church, Waco, Texas, dated the week of April 28, 1907. That was about the time that the congregation was moving into this sanctuary. And on the front is a rendering of the sanctuary. It still looks pretty much the same. It says, the new church, corner of 5th and Webster Streets where services are held. But here's the really important part. Down at the bottom in bold letters, it says, strangers welcome. <laughs> our verbiage is a little more elegant these days. We say, if you are a guest of ours this morning, we hope you'll take today's worship guide and fill out the tear-off portion, giving us a little bit of information about yourself. You may put it in the offering plate as it's passed, or even better, hold on to it until the end of the service and deposit it at the uh, welcome desk in the foyer. We have a gift waiting for you. So now it's time for all of us to stand and greet those around us and see if you can find a stranger to welcome. <laughs> Just sing with me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. One more time. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, 
Wonderful. It is great to be back in Waco. Uh, our two daughters, we have twin, identical twin daughters who had a lot of fun dating Baylor men here when they were here. And now our grandson starts Baylor uh, next couple of months, which we're really excited about. We'll be able, a little closer to see him. But it's great to be here with you guys, especially while David Bolin is suffering uh, somewhere in, I'm sure he's on vacation somewhere on a surf somewhere. But well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. When I was a Baylor student, I'd often play, um, and I would play in the garden. Only for it to end up. And they would never know, you know. Just, uh, you can do a lot of things when you're in Waco, you know. I want us to sing together to God be the glory. We're here to worship this morning. What a great time to be in the Lord's house. and. And to be able to play on this magnificent instrument, oh my goodness gracious, God is just going to do some great things today, I know, in our hearts. Would you sing to God be the glory? It's hymn 349. To God be the glory, great things he had done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life. sing in unison. Wonderful singing. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's message. guys how are y'all summer been going okay for you so far 
They're going well. You ready to go back to school? No. Yes, I am too. I think it's great stuff. Hey, I brought today a stick. This is a hiking stick that I made a, a few years ago. Uh, we use this when we go hiking. Uh, we we kind of share it up between the family. Uh, with sticks been a lot of different kind of cool places, but mostly it just goes hiking in Cameron Park. And uh, when you're going up those trails, this stick helps me to walk. Today, as I read a passage of scripture, we're going we're gonna to hear the Bible call us to walk, to walk in truth. That's a way of, of saying to live. Uh, and when the Bible talks about walking, it's just a, a way of talking about how we live. Uh, and just as this stick helps, helps me to walk on the trails at Cameron Park, Scripture gives us uh, guidance in, in how to, to walk and how to live our lives. Uh, and so a good bit of this are, are things I want you to put in your heart early in your life uh, and live out the rest of it, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for a chance to worship in this place today. We're grateful, Lord, that you have called us to yourself and that you have called us to life and to walk in your truth and your hope and your love. Today, Lord, we pray that you give us strength and, and guidance as to how to do that more faithfully and fully. Lord, we love you. We love you because you loved us first. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You have a great morning. Love you guys. Bye, buddy. I want you to remain seated, but sing along with me. The words are there in your worship guide. You may know this or it may be new to you. Regardless, the words are terrific. Let's sing together. There is an endless song that goes in my soul. I hear the And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting? Would you sing that chorus with me one more time? How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my wrecked by sin and strife discord filled my heart with pain Jesus swept across those broken streams stirred the slumbering chords
Now, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear him, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and all your soul. And as he commanded us to love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. Isn't that right? Sing with me. Charla, if you'll come and lead us now as we pray together. Ask God to open our hearts, be ready for the message that's to come, that he might bless this act of worship, giving ourselves. Our Father in heaven, how can we keep from singing? How can we keep from coming to worship you? We're so grateful to be able to call you Father, so very thankful for our earthly fathers. And at this time, Lord, we bring our offerings. We know they're such tiny offerings compared to Calvary. Nevertheless, we lay them at your feet. And we know that you can use them to do more than we can ask or imagine. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. very simple message just ordinary people God uses ordinary people God uses people just like you and me who are willing to do as he commands God uses people who will give him all no matter how small your all may seem to you for little becomes much when you place it 
in the master's hand just ordinary people God uses just ordinary people God uses people just like you and me who are willing to do as he commands God uses people who will give him all no matter how small your all may seem to you for little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands just like that little lad who gave Jesus all he had how the multitudes were fed with some fish and a piece of bread well what you have may not seem much but when it's yielded to the touch of the master's loving hand then you will understand that your life will never ever be the same ordinary people God uses just plain ordinary people God uses people just like you and me who are willing to do as he commands. God uses people who will give him all. No matter how small your all may seem to you, for little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. For little becomes much when you place it in the master's Would you please stand as we read the word of the Lord together? Second John, verse 4. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. Let's pray together. Our good and our holy God, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day, this beautiful Lord's day a day that you've given us to worship. We thank you for the promise of your word that as we draw near to you, that you draw near to us. And God, we thank you for all that happens when when we connect with you in this real and intimate way. God, you you call us to pour out our hearts, and, and so we pray and we sing. But Lord, we also come listening We come listening for a word that would give us strength and encouragement, correction, guidance. Lord, we come hungry, asking you to fill us with the bread of life. Today, Lord, we're mindful that during these summer months, many in our family of faith are traveling. Today, we're we're particularly mindful of our youth that are traveling even now to go to youth camp. We pray, Lord, that they would encounter you in a fresh and a real way that their lives would be encouraged and nourished and shaped, even as ours are in this place. So, Lord, we pray for them what we pray for ourselves, that you would give us all eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would give us tender hearts that would receive your word as seed planted in fertile soil. We pray, God, 
that you would give us feet that would walk quickly to do your will. We pray that you make our hands strong for deeds in this earth that they would be as your very own. And God, we pray that a word of hope and life would be found on our tongues. Precious Lord, this is our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. And we pray together this morning saying, Amen and Amen. Please be seated. We are in 2 John uh, mostly today. Uh, we are continuing the sermon series back to the beginning through the epistles of John. One of the characteristics of John's writing uh, is, is repetition. John just hammers the same things over and over and over again. Uh, I just got back from a great trip to Israel with the Alumni Network and, and Truett Seminary, and, and we were sitting on a, on a plane somewhere, and, and Meredith and Tommy Lou were there, and somebody asked, Matt, what are you preaching on this summer? Uh, and they both sort of rolled their eyes in a kind and loving way, uh, and I said, well, I'm preaching through uh, First, Second, and Third John. Uh, and, 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 and Tommy Lou said, well, it's mostly about love. Uh, and indeed it is. It's mostly about a lot of things because he comes back again and again to these re repetitive themes. He talks about Christ. He talks about the truth. He talks about love. Love for God and love for one another. And he puts all those things together and talks about discernment again and again. How we make wise decisions in the world that we live in. How we live our life, how we walk, how we worship, how we go about living in this world touched by his grace and his mercy. Today we come to an application point for all of these things. When we get to the little epistle, 2 John, 3 John, he takes these themes that he's repeated again and again, love and truth and discernment and Christ and he breaks them off into little pieces and he applies them to very concrete situations. When we come to 2nd and 3rd John, one of the application points for John is this idea of hospitality. I, I love this word. I love this idea. I, I'm a southerner, and we pride ourselves on being hospitable people. Not only am I a southerner, I'm a Mississippian. We're kind of crazy about this. We are the hospitality state. But a lot of people have started to think about hospitality in terms of Pinterest. You've heard of this? That hospitality is having the best party for a 10-year-old. Or hospitality is having a theme this or a theme that. Uh, or, or a great swanky party. Hospitality has become something like an art form to a lot of people. And that's great and that's fun and that's good. It makes life better. But when John talks about hospitality... He's talking about something much more bread and butter than additional spice. He's talking about making your way in a world when things are, are, are tough. He's talking about traveling in a world before, you know, Tom Bodette was leaving the light on for you. <laughs> he was talking about going through life, and he was calling the people to be a hospitable folk when it wasn't so easy. We have modern examples of, a, of, of experiences where hospitality matters to that, to that degree. During the Civil Rights Movement, African Americans couldn't come from Detroit to the Deep South and see their family uh, in large numbers and hope to stay in hotels. That type of common experience that we're used to was simply not available to them. So there was a system of hospitality born by people who would house others, create space, and make space. And you had to be smart about this. You had to be wise. You had to make decisions. And there had to be discipline. There had to be a structure to it. But there was a system of hospitality in place that made travel under those circumstances doable. Very recently, during the oil booms out in Midland and Odessa, when hotel rooms were five, six hundred dollars for the little ones, or if they were available at all, there were Sunday school classes of young adults at First Baptist Midland uh, that were organizing uh, so that people could come and see their grandkids. They was, do you have available space? Do you have a bedroom? Do you have a space so that, so that grandma and grandpa, that gran and mimi, uncle pop, and all these folks could come and see these kids? Hospitality. 
And John was living in the kind of world where this was necessary. It was necessary that this type of system would be in place so people could move and, and, and share and work and teach. But remember, the whole thrust of John's uh, epistles, the fact that people had infiltrated the church, they'd come into the church, and they were teaching a gospel that was not in accordance with Christ. They were pulling people away from the beating heart of God's grace and his mercy and his love that Christ has come among us to bear our sins and give us a new life, eternal and hopeful. But these itinerant ministers were on, on the road and so John was calling them to a hospitality that was wise uh, and that is real. You see an example of this in, in 2 John verses 9 and 10, where he says, Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. He was saying, don't wish God speed to this false teaching. Don't, don't give to this. Don't support this. Don't give life to this. This is not good for any of us. And then you go to 3 John. You turn one page. You go to this next little epistle. There were people in the church there who were taking advantage of this kind of teaching, and, and they were cheap, and they were stingy, and they were greedy, and they said, okay, well, let's just not support anything. Let's just not do anything to help out. And so he corrects that error in 3 John. We read in verse 5, Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Do you see how John's helping them take these principles, these great principles about truth and love and discernment and apply them in real time in concrete situations? Here, you don't make space and support financially those teachings that would pull you away from Christ. But don't fall off the horse on the other side. You may recall from time to time I say if I ever write a, a history of the church, it's going to be called intoxicated equestrians. We're drunk people on horses. We fall off one side only to remount and fall off the other side. And so if you're falling off by supporting all these pagan things, don't remount and fall off the other side and saying we won't support or be good to anyone. He said, no, be wise and discerning and put it into practice. You say, Matt, that's so difficult to have to make decisions in life? Shouldn't we just be able to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? Well, friends, we're not robots. God has not animated the world with robots. He has given you this, this great ability to think and to reason and to respond and to follow as he leads. And we're going to have to make some decisions in life and learn how to be discerning people. We have to learn how to be wise in the world as it is. So the question before us then is, well, how do we know when to hold them and when to fold them? How do we know when to walk away and when to run? Well, again, this is an occasion for us to go back to the beginning, back to these teachings, and learn again from God. So let's go back to the, the very first verse in chapter, uh, the, no chapters, but in 2 John, verse 1. Here's the address. The elder, to the elect lady, the lady chosen by God, and to her children whom I love in the truth, and not only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father has commanded us. So, the walking stick for the walk in truth today takes on two forms. And both of them, in a sense, are spiritual parenting one is the fact that we, in this text, are given the image of the Father, God the Father, 
and the Father, Son, Jesus Christ. John says, from God the Father and from his Son, Jesus Christ, flows mercy and peace and truth, uh, grace and love. This is the ultimate source of life. This is, this is the place that we return to again and again and again when we're trying to navigate the very complicated world that we live in, when we're trying to be people of wisdom and discernment, grace, mercy, peace, love, and righteousness. So there is the Father. And there is also this imagery here of the fact that we are children, that we are children of the elect lady the chosen lady. Now, people disagree to the exact nature of this. Some commentators say that the elect lady was a, a, a significant leader in the church, a, a person of great influence uh, who, could, who could guide and direct the rest of them. This is not hard for us to understand in this way. If you go to, to the book of Philippians, Philippians in large measure is, is written to address some of the challenges uh, that are between personal conflict between two of these very strong leaders in the church. These two mothers of the church, if you will, uh, who create space, hospitable place for the church to meet and who fund and guide and direct and are settle, settling influences in those bodies. It could be that the elect lady here is a person of great influence and strength. If you were to go to the Truett Memorial Baptist Church in Jackson, Mississippi, there is a mother of the church. Her name is B.B. Richardson. She is the elect lady of that church. She ran the nurses at University Hospital in Jackson for so many years. Uh, and she is the person to whom, when things come up in that church, everybody looks at her. And she could guide a meeting with a wink or a nod because of the content of her character and because of her leadership ability. She was the elect lady of that church. And even as I was the pastor there, I was one of her children following her lead. So it could be that. Or it could be that the elect lady, and this is the other option, is a way of talking about the church as a whole. Last night I had the privilege to participate in a prayer service at St. Paul AME Church here in Waco. Our friend Joel Gregory preached in Charleston at Emmanuel AME Church, celebrating the Charleston Nine, remembering them, and asking God to heal our world, to heal our land. In Charleston, Emmanuel AME Church is often called what? Mother Emmanuel. The first African American church in the South, a church of tremendous influence, a mothering institution that gave life to so many others. The elect lady with many, many, many children. The fact of the matter is, our lives are shaped profoundly by both individuals, mentors, spiritual mothers and fathers, and institutions. We've been shaped by our churches and our Christian institutions, and we've been shaped by those men and women who have faithfully served year after year after year after year with I set on one goal, which is to point us all to the one that lives in us and will be with us forever. Truth personified, Jesus the Christ. So we as followers of Christ, we have these, we have these gifts. We have the capital T, capital F, Father. And by the way, God is not a boy's name. When Jesus talked about the Father, he was, he was helping us to understand that God is personal, not that God was a boy. I don't think you needed that, but it's free of charge. <laughs> but we have the Father, God the Father, that we worship in spirit and truth. And we have mothers and fathers in the faith who guide and direct us. And for all of us, these resources and these sources help us to live a life of truth and love. When I sit at my desk, I can look to a little cabinet, and, and I always have in there these, these two little postcards, these, these two little pictures. One is, is Rembrandt's 
Return of the Prodigal. You, you remember this maybe from Henry Nouwen's great book about this, this scene. Uh, you, have, you have the father embracing this child that has wasted his life but has come home and is transformed by his mercy, his truth, and his love. This comes from that story where Jesus said, God is like that. God's like that. So every day at my, at my desk, as I'm writing, as I'm, as I'm emailing, as I'm thinking, I see this picture and reminded of Jesus' finger pointing and saying, God, the Father, my Father, is like that. And I also have, on the same shelf, this one from Gerhard von Hornthurst. This is titled uh, The Childhood of Christ, 1620. It, it hangs on the wall in, in the Hermitage in Russia. I love it because you have here the boy Jesus holding the, the candle for Joseph as he goes about his work. And I think about the fact that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, and that God the Father put some people in charge of that process, that life. And those people are Mary and Joseph. So today on this Father's Day, as we think about these resources, those individual mentors and guides and those institutions that shape us, perhaps we should think about how Jesus related to God the Father and about how Joseph related to Jesus and take with us some, some guidance for the task. First, let's think about Jesus and the Father. The scene is in John chapter 5. It's a familiar one to, to many of us. It's at the pool of Bethesda or Bethesda. Most of us go with Bethesda because there's a great hospital in Maryland named after that. So, so they're at this great pool, and Jesus heals a man. He comes to this man who is, who is invalid, and he's been there for years and years, and he asks him the most crazy question. What did he say? He says, do you want to be made well? And he says, well, well, I can't get in the water when the water is stirred. And this is a place where people had come for years and years. Uh, they, they'd come hungry and desperate. Maybe Asclepius would heal them. Uh, maybe God would heal them. Maybe something would, would be done here. And, and do you want to be made whole? And Jesus says, pick up your mat and go and, and, and be whole. And he does. Uh, and, and then there's this scene where, where this man ultimately tells the religious authorities what has happened. And then a big challenge, a big trial ensues. And that starts in, in verse 16 of chapter 5. Listen to this. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, watch this. My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This was a bold, bold claim by Jesus. And it wasn't, and I've heard it spoken of this way, it wasn't in the sense he just had a better understanding of human nature, that, that he, was, he was bold enough to claim what all of us have the right to claim. No, no, that's not it at all. Jesus knew about God and his unique relationship with God, and he was making these claims, and he understood it, and they understood it, and they tried to kill him because of it. And in response to this, beginning in verse 19, Jesus gave his defense. He gave his answer. He said, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Now look down in verse 24. He says, Very truly I tell you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and he will not be judged, but he has crossed from death to life. This is his great invitation. He says, I have come from the Father, and I have come to give life. This is his argument in the face of accusation. And, and in his opening statement, it's, it's followed by witnesses. He says, okay, don't believe me. 
Don't, don't believe me. Believe, believe this. Believe John the Baptist, verse 33. He was a light that shined brightly, and you enjoyed him for a while. Believe him. Believe the works that I'm doing. I have made this man whole before your very eyes. Believe the deeds. Believe the Father. Believe the Father who would speak, this is my son, listen to him. The one whose voice would speak over him and whose action would vindicate him by raising him to life from the dead. Believe the scripture. Martin Luther said that the Old Testament was the swaddling clothes and the manger that offered us Christ. Believe these things. John the Apostle could write the way he did because John knew this about Jesus. He called us to love and to truth because he believed in Christ. There was a personification of the truth and that this truth would be in us and with us forever. And as we try to navigate this world and make decisions in this complicated world, we need to remember this, that this is the settling place this is the place of wholeness. So there are the, the lessons we take from Jesus and the Father. But very quickly, what about Jesus and his dad? Oftentimes, Protestants do a horrible job with both Mary and Joseph. I've heard so many well-meaning evangelicals trip over Joseph, wanting to emphasize the virgin birth, which I affirm completely with full throat. But they will say things clumsily like, well, well, well Joseph wasn't Jesus' real daddy. That's bullheaded and short-sighted. I mean, I didn't even wrap that brick in velvet. <laughs> Absolutely. When God chose Mary and Joseph, he chose Mary and Joseph real people. In fact, in, in the Gospels, we hear this. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, Jesus is called the carpenter's son. In Mark 6, verse 3, Jesus is called the carpenter. Now, why was Jesus a carpenter and not a, a, a cheesemaker or a fishmonger or a tax collector? Those were great jobs, and he could have done them. Why not? Why wasn't Jesus a shepherd? Think about this for a moment. Think about all of the sermons that you could have heard if Jesus would have been a shepherd. <laughs> all of the great connections to King David. I mean, think what it would have done to your nativity sets if Jesus would have grown up to be an actual bona fide shepherd. <laughs> Did God miss it? The sermons would have been better. 2,000 years of better sermons. Why, God, was Jesus not a shepherd? He wasn't a shepherd because Joseph was a carpenter. Little boy in that home, he would learn a trade in the lap of his daddy. That great city, Sepphoris, about three miles from Nazareth, in the morning they'd get up and they'd pack a lunch when he was old enough to work. And they'd walk up that hill and they'd work all day in the blazing sun building those great Roman projects. They'd break for lunch and maybe Jesus would see them practicing for the plays, putting masks on. He'd see the hustle and bustle of a big time city. They'd work the rest of the day. They'd walk that three miles home at night. They'd eat supper. They'd get comfortable. They'd look up on the hill and they'd see the lights of Sepphoris up on the hill. Maybe that's what Jesus had in mind when he said a city on a hill cannot be hid. What we know is that Jesus spent more time with Joseph than those disciples. Maybe anybody else in the world. What do we know about Joseph? Very little in scripture. Very little in history. But what we do know is instructive. If you go back to, and you're going to have to have some imagination to do this with that blazing heat outside, but if you go back to those stories that you normally read in the presence of eggnog and sweaters, to the descriptions of Joseph, we know he was a righteous man. He was a man of truth. And we know that he was kind. 
compassionate. The one that the Father picked out to be the Abba of the Messiah is known for two things and only two things in history. That he was a good man. And he was kind. He was a man of love and of the truth. And he didn't think those things had to be divorced. But he lived them out the best way he could. So years later, when the disciple of Jesus is writing to his disciples, and he's calling them to love and to truth and to discernment. He could say to them, hey, look, look to the Father and to the Father's Son. Because from the Father and the Father's Son come peace and righteousness and truth and love. And hey, children of the elect lady, children of faithful faithful human guides that love God look to their example as well because they flesh it out in this earth so today give thanks to God for being your source of life give thanks to those men and women that have faithfully gone before you your spiritual fathers and mothers and recommit yourself to living that out because we live our lives in the presence of others who look to us to incarnate the challenge to be people of truth and love, righteousness, and kindness. God, it's going to take a miracle to pull this off. It's so difficult to balance the things you've called us to. And in fact, we shouldn't even attempt it on our own. Oh, Lord, we're grateful. We are grateful for all the resources that you have given to us that we could, we could take and apply in our lives so that we could live faithfully. We thank you, Lord, that you are the source of life. Help us to lean on you and depend on you for strength and wisdom. And, Lord, we thank you for our spiritual mothers and fathers. We thank you that we are, are children of the chosen lady. We thank you for their guidance and their strength. Lord, those that are still among us, we pray that you continue to nourish and strengthen them as they continue to lead us. And Lord, make us all people of righteousness and mercy that guide others so that we all can live like a city set on a hill. God, this is our prayer in the strong name of Christ. We say together, amen. Please stand. We're going to sing. If you have made decisions in the privacy of your heart and you would make them here today, we invite you to come as we sing together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let Let's close with a benediction. 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.